All right, we are live for a new episode of the Electric Podcast. I'm Fred Lambert, your host, and as usual, I'm joined by Seth Wintra. How are you doing today, Seth? I'm good, and today we actually have a very special guest, uh, Jim Taylor from Electric Last Mile Solutions or Elms, uh, CEO, and you know he's got quite a interesting history as well. So, Jim, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk to Jim for about 20 minutes and then get get back to our regular news. Uh, uh, so let's start it off, Fred. Fred, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Well, like like Seth mentioned, you have a pretty interesting background uh, in the automotive industry, like uh, based mostly with the uh, legacy automakers. You spent years at GM, Cadillac, and and a, a bunch of other companies. But it looks clear to me if I look at your resume that you, there was a big shift to electrification uh, around ten years ago. So if you could talk about how you went from like this big background in the automotive industry mm -hmm. to electrification, sure. Well, thanks first uh, for having me on your show. Appreciate the opportunity to tell our story. Yeah, from my story standpoint, uh, as you said, the first uh, few decades, I won't say how many at General Motors really gave me an outstanding base to spring two in my second uh, career. And uh, you know, one of the unique aspects of that was spending a lot of time in the operating half of the house and then being able to shift off to the sales and marketing and the dealer's end. So it gave me an opportunity to then uh, enter the next phase. And that was really, as you just said, electrification. So we think of it, you know, today we're embroiled in this space with uh, the news almost every day front page, but 10 years ago, it wasn't, wasn't quite that way. Tesla was just getting off the ground and it's a small company in Cincinnati at that time called Amp Electric Vehicle that was just getting uh, started. And so I went literally from one extreme, you know, huge automaker global down to a, a very small startup. So I wanted to get startup experience, um, but also think, all right, I think this uh, EV thing is going to be the next wave. And at that time, 10 years ago, it was a roll of dice. But of course, it turned in after that one. And then Next Karma was another you know, brand new startup, uh, restart, let's say, post bankruptcy. <laughs> and so it has all the normal uh, trials and tribulations of being a startup, but also an entry into halfway in the EV space, because that was hybrids, but getting to know the challenges uh, on the engineering side, the hardware side, but also the brand side, you know, how, how ready are people to adopt this technology, you know, past the just so called early adopters. And then uh, after Karma was up, launched, and we were selling vehicles, uh, took a short break. And then this opportunity came along that had kind of two chapters to it. One was initially starting with a company who had intentions to launching actually a crossover SUV. Good looking ones too. We, we yeah, saw very those nice. Yeah. And ironically, as this whole small world intertwines, was designed by Henrik Fisker. Bet you didn't know that. And so... Uh -huh. uh, we were about to launch that vehicle, but also the, the company was uh, simultaneously launching the exact same vehicle in China. My recommendation is, whoa, they had taken on that is uh, a huge task. Even global aut automakers struggle to launch simultaneously at different continents hand in hand. So we put the whole thing on hold. While it was on hold, we kind of pivoted and said, hey, you have other products. How about these uh, commercial vans that you already have in production? and, and uh, delivering product in uh, China, why don't we launch those instead? So quick study, decided to pivot, uh, switch directions, and then launch these uh, vans. So unfortunately, you know, at that time, the China economy is melting down. They don't have really enough cash to launch this uh, vehicle program internally funded in the US. So we put together, you know, call it a deal. It said, all right, what if I set up my own company with my partner and uh, we buy your plant? We get the intellectual property rights to make manufacture these vehicles, and we go raise money. Deal is, okay, let's do it. So we went out, and uh, the short version, we aligned ourselves with uh, one of the million SPACs that appears to now be out in the market. Mm -hmm. We got lucky. We got some great partners, uh, established that very quickly, went to the rest of the market to you know go through all the steps and processes. So as this transaction is uh, closing in about a month, then you know simultaneously, we take the money in from the SPAC, we buy all of these assets uh, from the current company and we're in business. So the, for, for people who are not aware, those current companies were um, Ceres, is that how you pronounce that? Uh, yeah, yes, Ceres? the US brand name is Ceres, S-E-R-E-S. -E and then and, uh, actually their China. original name in the US was SF Motors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, but the, yeah, the mother company in China is S-O-K-O-N, Socon. Socon, okay. So, and, and so what, what exactly, so you, you guys are raising how much money with this pack? At the end of the day, when all this closes and the dust settles, we'll have a little less than 400 million that will come into the company uh, for okay. us to start. Mm -hmm. And exactly what, what, what production capacity are you, are you buying with, with that uh, with all that cash? Yeah, you'll see a theme here, Fred, as we go through my story. But mm -hmm. 
uh, I don't want to say ironically, it's, it's kind of a perfect storm, but the plant that we're purchasing is actually a plant that as a engineering, um, let's say a member of the senior engineering team at the truck group and GM, we originally established to build Hummers, the H2s. So AM General actually owned the plant out in uh, just by South Bend, Indiana, so-called Mishawaka. Mm-hmm. And that plant was built uh, first for H2s, later made some Mercedes there, later made some uh, taxis, MV1s. But after it was uh, finished its sort of useful life, then AM General sold it to SF Motors to series. Mm-hmm. And so now we'll be buying it back uh, from them as part of this transaction. So my original Hummer plant becomes mine again. Yeah. Well, for those who don't know, Jim, was uh, uh, you, you were the head of the Hummer brand for a while, right? Uh, yes. For yeah. a few years. Yeah. Yes, I was. Is your old office still in there? <laughs> <laughs> it is. And it's exactly like it was Yeah, 10 That's years funny. ago. That's it's funny. A, you know, that's another old story we'll do on another podcast. But, you know, to be honest, it was pretty sad, you know, shutting the Hummer brand down because it was a phenomenal brand, but it was a big, complicated story during bankruptcy. And ironically, you know, during an era where, frankly, GM was taking a lot of heat for not being greed enough. Now, think of that now, uh, 10 years later. And on it all comes great, around. Great yeah, reputation. The they're super aggressive in the electric space. So yeah. things have changed a lot at GM. But at that time, you know, it wasn't so cool having, the, you know, the Hummer brand be the face of the company. So uh, we had to take the brand down. But here we are coming back to the plant. We'll be relaunching it and bringing this. And to answer your question, Fred, it has a capacity of about 100,000 units. So mm-hmm. we'll be using that uh, up until about the fourth year of production. We'll be hitting about 80,000. So we're getting close to the capacity, but we've got lots of runway there. That's great. Yeah. Um, so can you help us, like we've talked about the background, can you help us understand like the uh, the market and the commercial EV mm-hmm. landscape and, and growth opportunities? Um, you know, sure. uh, Elms is like the first EV to market in, in the class one, and it's pretty much the only thing around right now. Will be. Yeah, let's start at the top. And I think nobody has to you know, understand this. You look out your front door every night and uh, see what's there. It's, of course, it can be boxes coming from someplace. So the e-commerce, uh, even before COVID, was already on a rapid increase, you know, compliments of Amazon, but a lot of other companies. And then you took uh, the, the COVID uh, time where we all had to be at home and couldn't go shopping. Of course, that curve uh, bent straight north. And uh, so that's about a trillion dollar business right now. And it's actually literally the tip of the iceberg. That's probably only representing 25, 28 percent of actual shopping still. So a huge amount of upside in the e-commerce space. Drill that down next to uh, the, the delivery companies that have to support that e-commerce. And that's about a $40 billion business right now, again, bending straight north. Then you take that down to the delivery hardware people themselves, you know, GM, Ford, FCA that supply these vans now today that have to feed that business, a huge amount of stress on just the hardware. All these companies are trying to get this limited number of vehicles, you know, to do their services. So as you probably see, again, at your house on the weekends, a lot of people are showing up in just their cars because there literally aren't enough, uh, you know, vans in the market to be able to fulfill the uh, the supply side of this. So with that backdrop, there's just uh, suffice it to say a huge amount of demand for uh, vehicles that can carry packages and deliver them in this so-called last mile space. Well, then on top of that, in the electrification where we're entering, of course, there are no other announced entries down in this uh, small segment in the small van segment. Excuse me, the cargo van segment. GM has announced coming into the what we call class two, the next segment up uh, Ford full size transits also coming in there. And then there's you know plenty of uh, other entrants up in the class three, but we'll be the first entrant, as you said, Seth, into class one. Uh, we have a carrying uh, capacity, a little technical of 170 cubic feet. So it's a little bit of a call it a tweener. The normal class ones are 125. The class twos are about 250. So we sit kind of straddling between those two segments. So We'll be able to take some of the smaller loads in class two, certainly the larger loads in class one. And because electric vehicles, this is all now kind of a matter of record, actually run at a lower operating cost than gas vehicles, it's actually a 30 to 35 percent savings in running this, you know, head to head with a gas vehicle. So there's an economic now incentive for any of the operators to move from their current gas vehicles onto these, or if it's a uh, kind of addressing this increase in supply, new vehicle purchases as opposed to replacements will more and more want to be electric and then kind of back up to the market again. As you've seen with the Biden administration's announcement recently, you see big companies like FedEx saying 50% of my fleet is going to be electric. You've got states of like California saying anything new in the commercial space you know, has to be purchased that's going to be 
uh, electric, you know, companies like GM saying I'm going across the board. So, you know, you add up all that and there's a uh, good time to be coming into the market as we are. Yeah. I, I'm just curious, were you, uh, surprised by the the post uh u.s post office going with uh, a gas uh company i was and then honestly let me take this right on you know take take workhorse lordstown everything out it just as an announcement i was quite surprised because you know you get simultaneously you could see where the wind was blowing the Biden sure. administration were certainly heading this way in a big way and then all of a sudden you know right in the middle of that was a uh, you know, pretty traditional announcement to go a uh, great company. I mean, there's nothing, uh, obviously no issue with Oshkosh, but the kind of uh, go that direction was, was very surprising. I know there's been some aftermath and some, you know, contesting a decision and things like that, but didn't really fit into this, you know, the, the picture that was being painted from uh, Washington going forward and still being painted. If, if another, uh, 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 opportunity came out, uh, would you guys be at all interested in, in competing for that? work on track? Well, it's going to be too technical of an answer, Seth, but I was, uh, you know, privy and saw the, this is more like a request for quote and then an answer. That, that was a very purpose built, unique <laughs> shaped right. object that the post office wanted with, let's say, pretty much all new tooling and, and very expensive. Um, I think it deflect the question and answer it this way. I think the post office is going to need a lot of vehicles of all flavors and sizes. Mm. The one they gave Oshkosh is one I think this vehicle is a perfect one. If you see the size of the current post office vehicle, it shows mm -hmm. up at your house, little small box. And uh, also back to, I should probably use this plug now, but you know, for what is the perfect duty cycle for an electric vehicle? And you know what's going on in the passenger space where one of the challenges for adopt adoption is range, right? Everybody's mm -hmm. worried about uh, range anxiety and, hey, what if I want to go 350 miles this weekend, not 250? Am I going to run out? Where's the chargers? Actually, these short range, you know, short distance delivery vehicles is, is the perfect application for EVs. So it's a little ironical. It's one of the last, you know, things to come to market versus probably should have been the first instead of even passenger vehicles. But we don't need a very big battery, just 42 kilowatts. We don't need very much range, even though the range is forecasted to be about 150 miles, probably only needs 40 to 60 miles a day because it's short distance, you know, like the postal trucks. You think how far they go each day and it's all stop and go, stop and go. Mm -hmm. It really is a perfect uh, electric application. And they go back to the barn at night so they can all get charged. So yep. all of the normal challenges of retail adoption uh, actually go away in this uh, small electric uh, delivery space. Yeah, that, that's right. And you, you touched it about the actual duty cycle makes perfect sense for, for delivery. And compared to passenger cars too, the, the way that people buy commercial vehicles, is that most of them almost buy it from a spreadsheet, like what makes sense in terms of the of the cost. So can you elaborate a little bit like that? Like how, how does yeah. it make sense for, for people to buy uh, the specific uh, uh, electric mass yes. vehicle? No, you're right. Let me just reinforce that, Fred. When you're a, a fleet owner or a fleet manager, you're a business and you know what's the most important part of a business making money so you know all of the things i purchase all the assets or tools towards making more money or supporting the the uh, flow of if income into my company so first thing they look at is not just the cost to buy the vehicle but so-called total cost of ownership so that's initially the acquisition cost but then after that what's the daily operating cost and maintenance cost and uptime you know reliability so our emphasis in the in the product that we're showing our fleet uh, manager customers is we will have the lowest cost of ownership in the segment. Here's the math. We'll show it to you. And then also we're going to have the highest reliability because one of the differences in the business approach that we're taking, and you know, there's a lot of new entrants in this space uh, that are coming in. Uh, a lot of them, I'd say most of them are coming from a clean sheet or a call it a you know white piece of paper that they have to develop a whole platform put all the suppliers in place, you know, go through all the validation testing and finally launch the vehicle in many cases, even through a new plant. So in our case, we're coming off an existing platform, existing vehicles already in market. We have to go through an engineering exercise to adapt them to the U S regulations, impact, you know, requirements, safety and things like that. So it's not mm -hmm. just bring them in and, and uh, take them to the customers, but uh, we're coming off of, you know, a known set of uh, mileage and warranty and, and customer experiences. So, we have a lot of confidence in being able to tell our customers that they're going to have excellent reliability experience right from the get-go. We're not sort of prototyping that on our customers as we launch a brand new platform, brand new technology, and uh, brand new vehicles. So if you add the operating cost and then also the initial uh, purchase cost together, 
added together nose to nose against the current gas one gas uh, class one vehicles, we'd be about 35% less um, total cost of ownership per mile. So that's very important, again, uh, for the savings uh, for, for the customer. So you probably know, but historically, if you go back, again, go all the way back 10 years when I started in this space in the commercial truck vehicle business, and then even five years ago, what you're really going to a fleet owner and saying, hey, I bet you want to be green, don't you? How much are you willing to pay for that? Almost like, yeah. you know, today's consumers in the passenger vehicles, I bet you want to pay 10000 or 20000 more or 30000 but but the operating cost is lower. So trust me, in three or four years, those curves will break even, you know, and then you'll, you know, you look like a, a smart guy. That's a tough sell to somebody that's trying to manage capital today with ours, with the $7,500 uh, today, federal tax credit, you pay 32, your net's 25. That's exactly the same price as the gas vehicle. So you're not faced with paying a premium um, to get into this space. So at mm -hmm. equal acquisition costs and then lower operating costs, you can say like, why not? Yeah, well, I'm not familiar with the the class one uh, <laughs> van. I've never been on the market for one, but that that's the gasoline <laughs> one. So that's about the price range, twenty five thousand. Yeah, that's the starting that's MSRP it. for like a Ford Transit Connect, the mm -hmm. uh, Ram ProMaster City, a Nissan NV two hundred. Yeah, starting price twenty five. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we were hearing things about the tax rate too that could even improve that. So. Uh, <sighs> Yeah, there's uh, <laughs> exactly talk about whether there, you know, there's a current limit of 200,000 vehicles per OEM. Maybe that gets extended up. Mm -hmm. Might be that the 7,500 gets increased. There's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's all kinds of proposals, maybe the 10 grand. But, you know, just to, again, to throw gas on the fire here, that we also, of course, in California has in additional state mm -hmm. credits on top of the 7,500. So once you go to that level, now it's actually a lower cost than the comparable gas vehicle. And of course, those are in place because of what, California is trying to do is convert their uh, overall fleet much quicker. Yeah, a few other states too that uh, that, that would make a lot of, make a lot of sense with the incentive. Not that like I mean w with the lower cost of operation and maintenance too. Uh, even without incentive, it would probably be competitive. Uh, that's my understanding. Yeah. Right now. yeah. Yes. Yes. True. So, um, James, Jim, uh, not James, Jim, Jim, James. Uh, <laughs> can you help us uh, talk uh, talk to us a little bit about um, the current customers? partners, mm -hmm. pre-orders, like what, what do you have kind of laid out here? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for asking. This is kind of a, a hot subject, but also, you know, uh, I think confusing subject for some. So the industry uh, has a label for these so-called pre-orders, but you know, let me go back and be legal for a second, non-binding pre-orders, which essentially means that uh, we approach the customer with almost the same level of communication we're talking about. Here's the vehicle, 170 cubic feet, 150 miles range, $25,000 available this fall, are you interested? And so the first round of this uh, conversation is count me in knowing there's nobody else coming in the market. I wanna get you know kind of to the front of the line um, to make sure that I can protect some allocation in our uh, ramp up plan. And that's as far as we go. And then they sign, physically sign, hand us the pre-order that says, you know, count me in for a thousand, for 5,000, you know, for 10,000, whatever the number is. And obviously, from our standpoint, selfishly, we'd like to go to the big boys first and, you know, get some marquee customers in the door that uh, we can rely on for long term growth and things like that, all the way down to some more you know, local also uh, fleets and customers that are uh, loyal customers of some of the dealers that we're working with. So it ranges in size of these fleets. But really importantly is the next set of steps, uh, Seth, because to move that from a pre-order down to real live purchase order that you can say now is, is in our system and we're, we and they are banking on it. Then we go through a series of steps and those have to be uh, a technical exchange between the customer and us of what are you gonna use these for? How much uh, upfitting do you want? You know, customizing, what are you gonna use this vehicle for? If it's, you know, Cox Automotive, you're gonna convert this into a cable car, repair car. If it's a pharmaceutical car, is, is it need a refrigeration unit? So all of the specifications that go to make it unique the other area which is really important to fleets is the data and the data system that they want, the, the uh, different fields of data, tracking data, et cetera. What kind of a data recorder and uh, telematics transmitter do you want? So all of those exchanges go on. Next is come to the plant. I mean, we're a new brand, we're a new company. They want to visit, see that, you know, where are we going to make these and, you know, hear about our, our quality system, et cetera. Want to drive a vehicle? Okay, can I, can I see one? Can I drive one? So there's a series of steps you go through that, you know, are kind of a, set of boxes that the uh, fleet's got to tick. We're not GM that they can kind of plan on delivering what they say because they've been buying vans for, you know, 100 years from them. 
And so uh, we go through those. When we finish all those, okay, we're good to go. Now we sign a real confirmed, call it purchase order. That's when it flips and we say, all right, I'm promising you a thousand in December, or, you know, 2000 in February. Now, you know, we literally are on the hook to deliver those uh, based on our commitment. So there's, uh, again, a little bit of confusion in these is uh, what's the definition of a pre-order? Are they confirmed? The answer is no, they could walk at any time. But if they walk, they're out of line and there's nowhere to go. So they have to consciously decide to just check out. Um, later on, if there's more competition, you know, then that might be a, a trade-off where they could be looking at us versus other product. But uh, short term, we haven't seen anybody leave the line. And in fact, uh, you know, as people get become more aware of this, they've doubled down and increased their orders. All right. Well, thank you so much, James. Uh, that's uh, kind of our, our 20 minutes there. But I think you wanted to show us uh, something that uh, other SPOCs haven't really <laughs> been able to show us. So uh, right. with that, uh, thank well, you so I'll, much. Uh, I'll finish with the beginning, up. which is, uh, again, the emphasis that in our particular you know, situation here in coming off of, uh, we call them proven, reliable, existing uh, platforms, that uh, when you come to visit us, you can actually drive the vehicle. And uh, some of these other uh, <laughs> startups that you arrive at, uh, that may not be possible. So thanks again for the opportunity to be on your show. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. All right, we're going to have a chance He's to a see. He's a gentleman. He didn't name uh, those other startups. <laughs> <laughs> for those who are only listening right now, I'm going to describe what's happening, <laughs> which is Jim Altsigli got into the electric uh, last right. mile solution van, and he drove away, and he's out of frame right now. And, and, and it's not downhill. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh. I, did, oh. I didn't see anyone push the van. All right, so that that's it for... Uh, Elms, we appreciate them coming on. Uh, it was fantastic to talk to Jim. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have some Tesla news. All right, let's 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 jump into the news this week. A bunch of news items to discuss, and we know, we're we going to start with um, Mall S and X deliveries. I, I have so many emails every week about new Mall S and X buyers for the refresh version that are like, hey, uh, have you heard anything about incoming? Uh, they, I haven't heard anything from Tesla, but this week actually a bunch of people heard from Tesla, but it wasn't really good news. Uh, those those uh, reservation orders, not actually though, they are they they have orders. It's not even reservation. Like <laughs> we just went through a whole segment <laughs> about what the difference between a pre order and a order. Well, those are on orders, uh, and um, a lot of people that place their order right after the unveiling and even before the unveiling for the engineering for the plaid because Tesla actually took orders for the plaid before that. Uh, they had a March, April, and May delivery timeline, uh, and a lot of them this week uh, saw their timeline being pushed uh, through May, June, and even July from for again orders that have been on the books for months by now. So it, it becomes clear at this point that Tesla has run into some issues bringing the new version of, especially the Model S. The Model X, I think, is, is, is expected a little bit behind the Model S at this point, but it becomes clear that there's a there's a delay in bringing the, the vehicle to production. I mean, just a few um, a month ago, almost, Elon mentioned that the production lines are almost done with the retooling, but uh, even even then, it's uh, it hasn't produced. Well, hasn't produced, uh, hasn't delivered any any vehicle yet. It looks like there's some vehicles that are being produced, but the deliveries are are lagging behind. Uh, and he was saying at the time that max production is going to be achieved next quarter, which is now this quarter in Q2. So within the next three months, and we know that getting to max production takes a while. So there's a ramp up. So we would expect some deliveries before that. It's just not happening yet. So don't hold your breath for the new Model S and X. But I would expect some some deliveries this quarter, nonetheless. Just uh, I would be I would be surprised if it's a, a significant amount. Do you think a YouTuber is going to get one before uh, before anybody else sees them, or how's I it going to go down? Everyone's a YouTuber these days. Right. <laughs> like, like as soon as someone take a delivery, it's gonna be on YouTube. Don't and they're a YouTuber. Yeah, I mean, nothing too crazy for us to to see from the car in person. I think the the biggest thing, and you touched to that last week, and I think you might be right, is the software that might be actually what's holding up the deliveries. Like Tesla has some work to do for the software here. It sounds kind of uh, 
not that much. Like you have, oh, you have a new screen in the back. They went from a vertical screen to an horizontal screen. But that new horizontal screen is actually a, a full redesign of the screen. It's not like Tesla can take the Model, a, a Model 3 and Model Y software and put it on that screen. Right. It's, uh, on the Model 3 Model Y, you have almost half the screen that's the instrument cluster. Now with the Model S and X, you still have the, uh, well, actually, it's a new instrument cluster too, so you kind of have to retouch that also. Yeah, so, totally yeah. new UX there. Totally new. So I wouldn't be shocked, it's speculation, but I wouldn't be shocked if software is part of uh, why Tesla is not delivering those cars yet. And uh, we know that Tesla has been talking about that V11 for a while now, version 11 of the software coming to other cars too. And um, uh, we, we kind of expected it late last year as the holiday update. Then all the update was because the holiday update was, ended up kind of soft. It wasn't, it wasn't too crazy. So, so yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's it. All right, uh, more Model 3 and Model Y price changes that happened overnight last night. Uh, but this time it wasn't just price changes. It was also a slight update to the interior. That little trim right there, you can see it better maybe on the white one here. Um, we already saw that on the Model 3 being produced in, in China, uh, Gigafactory Shanghai. But uh, it has made it to the one in the U.S. now. So it's basically just a, a continuation of the dashboard trim uh, going into the doors on each side. Uh, looks pretty cool, but uh, yeah, as as Tesla updated that, they also changed the pricing. Uh, basically, increased the pricing across the board on the Model Three by five hundred dollars for the standard range plus and long range all wheel drive, and a, a nice thousand bucks for the performance version, which is now fifty seven thousand dollars. It ain't cheap. Model Y also saw uh, one price uh, change, a five hundred dollar increase on the long range all wheel drive, which now costs fifty thousand five hundred. And, uh, well, I mean, this is literally the fourth price change in as many months for Tesla this year. So <laughs> kind of crazy, crazy year for price changes for Tesla, especially crazy uh, start of the year. Um, Do yeah. we know if, if the uh, Model Y standard range that you have to call them up uh, got a price change? No, it did get its uh, EPA official rating today right. from uh, from the EPA, uh, uh, making it one of the most efficient vehicle in the world, literally. But even even though even that, uh, apparently, I'm hearing from people that they cannot even buy it right now. They tried to buy it and they can't even off the menu. So it might be discontinued altogether. I don't know. Uh, I know that you and I agreed on the potential theory that um, Tesla might know something about the incentive changing, and that and that might be related to the price changing that you're seeing now too yeah but um tesla might be adjusting at pricing right now and even like with the standard range model y uh they, they might be trying to position themselves to be in a better situation when the new incentive the reform to the uh tax credit or maybe it was going to be just a straight rebate uh, in the U.S. at the federal level, uh, it starts uh, later this year because we've been hearing that, uh, or at least expecting that there would be some kind of price cap related to it. Uh, it would make sense because, uh, of course, like um, incentivizing people to buy like sixty plus thousand dollar vehicles, whether they're electric or not, that doesn't sit well with a lot of people, understandably. So if if Tesla comes if like they come up with a price cap for forty five fifty thousand dollars and it might be a price cap similar to the one that we have in Canada where the actual cap is for the base price so you need to have a a trim within a certain model to be a certain price and then ten thousand more than that you can buy a car so for the Model Three for example Tesla did this whole thing where they have a forty five thousand dollars vehicle that no one's gonna buy <laughs> because although some people have bought it. Some people, but a handful of people apparently bought, bought it. It's not, and, it, and you can't unlock it, right? You cannot unlock it. And not even that. You can unlock it. Like people thought that at least, um, like the range is capped at 150, but not necessarily the battery pack, which means that uh, would mean, especially here in Canada, when it's the winter, you would still get 150 kilometers of range uh, and not, not get hit on the efficiency. But no, apparently Tesla software locks the battery pack capacity altogether at the equivalent of getting 150 and then you get less than that in the winter because of the efficiency issues which right. is i mean that's really bad like you don't you don't want that like this, this doesn't make the car useless but i mean buy a leaf and it's going to be a lot cheaper if you want a cheap car that's that, that would make more sense at that point anyway uh because with that, though, you can still buy a standard range plus because it's still less than $55,000, $10,000 plus than the, the, the price cap. 
and uh, and then you get the five thousand dollar discount on that. So I don't know. It, it's something that a lot of people have been looking at because with the reform coming to the incentive in the U.S., they could be looking at other markets as an example. And uh, the Canadian incentive has been quite successful. So maybe Tesla is trying to position itself here for 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 his model, its model to optimize access to the new credit or rebate, while uh, also. Um, increasing profit because the, those price increase for the model three now 38,500 it's actually pretty uh it's it's i think it's 1500 bucks higher than it was at the beginning of the year basically so as far as standard range um and and the the model uh y standard range um we were talking about before um what do we know about uh tesla using lfp batteries like they do in in china could that be part of the, I mean, like, you know, I have a couple questions about that. Like if Tesla wanted to change its Model Y in the U.S. to LFP batteries, um, would they have to redo their EPA testing on that yeah. battery? Yeah, okay. I think they would. Also, I don't, I don't think they would do that. Uh, I think because, I mean, the, the, they probably can use all the FP batteries they can get in China right now. So right. shipping those from China to the US, because you won't, you won't, I don't think there's many LFP, or well, at least high volume LFP battery manufacturer in the US or anywhere else in China for that matter. Right. So so uh, I don't think it would be efficient for Tesla to do that. Uh, and, and we know that Model 3 and Model Y batteries are uh, that are produced, Model 3 Model Y vehicles produced in the US get their batteries from Gigafactory uh, Nevada, uh, which is a very short, uh, supply chain so very advantageous for tesla so i don't see that happening in the near future but hmm. it would make sense for the ones in china though right uh, i don't even know that tesla is producing a standard range model y in china right now but uh, uh probably soon it would make yeah. sense for that to be lfp all right moving on to the supercharger network is getting a new world largest station uh surprise surprise it's in california so the, the, the routes, uh, there's a bunch of different routes between uh, the Bay Area and Los Angeles, which are two of Tesla's biggest markets uh, city-wise. And um, there's there's been a very big growth in the uh, travels between those two um, those two regions, even though it's like it's kind of, it's a five-hour drive or something like that, depending on how fast you drive. Uh, and it's not a fun drive. It's like it's like nothing, although, I mean, the grave vines may be near Los Angeles are fun, but after that, it's just a whole bunch of nothing. Um, but with a Tesla, it's it's pretty cheap to, to do it, uh, to, to drive there. Um, so a lot of people have been doing it, and Tesla has been increasing the capacity to charge on the way because you're going to need to stop to charge for most car. Like You can stretch it maybe with a long-range Model S, but you're going to stretch it. Um, so so they've been increasing the, the capacity there. We Firebar uh, became the biggest station in the world by capacity because it's a v3 super station there's a bigger one i think it has 56 oh yeah 56 star uh there's a bigger one in shanghai at 72 but it's 120 kilowatt capacity so the 250 v3 because that makes a big difference like people sometimes just focus on stalls but the charging capacity of the stalls make a big difference because you have higher capacity can charge faster you can the average charging session becomes shorter which means fewer stall can handle more capacity there's a faster turnaround which is a big deal but now uh, they are upgrading the iris range uh, supercharger which is again uh, almost smack that in the middle between the, those two markets and uh, it only had uh well this is number 18 charging stalls now it's getting at least 82 more because the iris range uh, in and restaurant which is tesla's property partner for the station said that they would be more than 100 stalls after the upgrade and those stalls are expected to be v3 superchargers of course so now you have a, over 100 stalls most of them v3 this is going to be the highest capacity supercharger station in the world and i think it's going to be we're going to see more of those like just giant station between big markets for tesla because especially in the us we've just been talking about the uh new ev incentive coming i think tesla is expecting a lot of growth in the us in the short term so you're going to want to have the capacity to support that um, but it's going to be cool looking apparently there's also going to be uh batteries installed there so maybe a mega pack is going to be dropped there something like that uh, that would be cool 
well, yeah, nothing worse than uh, arriving at a supercharger on a long road trip and you have to wait for it. It's a hundred stalls, though. That's like that's going to be like a scene, you know, like uh, on the Friday night or something. That's going to be mm -hmm. like, you know, a party almost, you know, post COVID. Like there's going to be a hundred mm -hmm. Tesla people. You know, they have those like Tesla meetups. It's going to be a meetup every. Oh yeah, for sure. It's going to be a meetup. I don't, it might not be too far from like a racing track too, like uh, the the Bottom Willow. How far is Bottom Willow from Iris? It's not that close, but it's not that far either. That restaurant's going to do well. Yeah, that that's the thing. Why it makes the Irish Ranch Station already a popular one is the anonymity is there. You have a you have the Irish Ranch restaurants, but if you cross the highway just the other side, you have a bunch of uh, uh, fast uh, fast food places too. So. If you don't want to sit down or anything like that, you can just go faster with that. Especially at two fifty, uh, like uh, two fifty. If you're stopping, you got to go real fast. Yeah, you, you're not gonna want to have a whole sit down meal necessarily. Like you, you're gonna have to move your car if you don't want to get charged uh, idle fees. So right. that's uh, or order ahead or something. Yeah. Um, all right. Now let's move to oh, one of our more controversial posts of the week. The toxic Tesla super fans are back. And now their their, st their stories are going mainstream, which is, I think is not a good look for uh, the the Tesla community and the electrification in general. Now I want to preface this by saying because a lot of people think that when we talk about toxic super fans, we talked about all Tesla fans, which is we couldn't be further from the truth. Um, obviously, not every fan acts like that. It's a small minority, but it's a very vocal minority, which gives a bad name to the rest of the. Tesla community, so so I think it it, it should be addressed. Uh, of course, we had this other very controversial article about it last year, trying to warn the community about that kind of behavior of just just spreading misinformation, uh, um, trying to suppress any negative comments about Tesla, especially doing it in a rude way, which is the worst. And but now. Uh, it, it caught the attention of the uh, Detroit Free Press, uh, especially because of a bunch of Mackie, new Mackie owners. Uh, in, in, uh, and I think all the Mackie owners quoted an article were actually Tesla owners that are getting a Mackie, um, which is so they're already guys that are part of the Tesla community. They're just getting another EV. And uh, um, the, the main owner that was quoted in the article. Uh, was, was still a Tesla owner too. He wasn't. He wasn't even replacing his <laughs> Tesla with a Mackie. He just favored. He just liked the Mackie and wanted to have it too. And and did some kind of review on social media um, of the comparison between that and the Model Y. And uh, he got yeah. hit by the usual Tesla mob that goes after you when you when you post comparable things that are. F favorable reviews of uh, other electric vehicles compared to a Tesla. And uh, it went pretty crazy. I mean, they quoted a bunch of uh, comments that he received from the those Tesla super fans that were uh, even uh, he considered one a death threat. I don't know if you, I, would, I would consider it a death threat too, but he said that a bunch of people said that he hoped that the, the car would break and he would, he would be uh, injured by it or even die by it. So very unsavory comment, like makes no sense, completely disturbing people. But it's a real problem in the Tesla community right now. Like, and I, I have to think it's related to the stock, like people, because I feel like if if you're really like, because there's, I think I feel like there's two types of Tesla super fans, and one of them is a toxic Tesla. Because I think there's like three levels actually of Tesla fans. There's just two, a Tesla two fan. types, three levels. Yeah, there's actually just a normal Tesla fan that's just someone that likes the car, likes the company, likes the mission, likes whatever, and he's just like follows things and doesn't comment. Which which is the most people I think. Most people don't comment on 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 on, on things. They just they just like things and, and enjoy it and maybe talk to it about it with with their friends. Um, then there's the super fan, but super fans. Can can come from like I think mostly like a stock perspective, like they just like crazy about the Tesla, the stock wise, they invest in the company and everything. And others that they're all about the mission, like because because that's the kind of thing that can broaden those feelings. I think that come where where the, those feelings where those very emotional comments can come from, uh, if it affects your money or if it affects something that you're very passionate about, like accelerating the transition to electric vehicle and and fighting climate change. Um, I think the bold can get nasty. Like I've seen nasty comments from, from people that just like, if you do something that's not pro climate, they will get after you. So, so I'm not saying that bold things are, are necessarily perfect. And there's plenty of people that 
are passionate about the stocks, but they're going to be rational about it. But I think that there's there's a source of on both sides on, on that front. But yeah, so, I, so you've given this some thought. <laughs> yeah, of course. Especially after my first article last year, that that I mean, that was that was a, a beep show that, that came out of uh, of that. Yeah, uh, we should have a beep button, like beep, like a sensor button. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think now that it's coming mainstream like that, that was taking up. That was a big post about it by the Detroit Free Press. I. I I think the community just need to be more careful about it and, and choose their word carefully when they, um, and, and I'm not saying you don't like try to argue against a favorable review of the Mackie versus the Mol Y. Uh, I definitely think that the Mol Y has a bunch of advantage over the Mackie, but I also like the Mackie and, uh, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind having one. Um, Though if you press me, which one I would choose between the Mac key and Mol Y, I'd probably go with the Mol Y. But I, I I can see advantages from the Mac key too. Uh, so don't don't necessarily like stop commenting. Just do it in in a way that's not combative. I don't know, like it's still one more EV on the market. It's still a plus. It's still a good thing. So I don't I just don't know why people are so combative about it. Other than like I said, they just want to see Tesla crush the market with the electric vehicles. They're already doing that. <laughs> right. That's not already already won on that front. And he's gonna probably keep winning for a long time. Um yeah, it's yeah. weird. It's like, you know, Tesla owns 80% of the market share in the US. Yeah. Like, come on. Like it's and and frankly, like Ford Maki is a pretty good car. I reviewed it. I thought it was a nice car. Um, you know, I, I still own two Teslas, so you know, obviously didn't convince me to sell my Tesla and buy a Maki, but like, what do you guys expect to happen? Like, you want all the other car companies to go out of business and Tesla to be the only car company? And then Tesla owns, you know, all its customers and can do whatever it wants. You want Tesla to have good competition. Yeah. So it's a Which little bit be better at Tesla too. Like, right. Right. In the long run, that makes everything better. So it's a little bit frustrating. Like, I know I've I've lost my temper with some of these guys before. Um, it's it's like, come on, guys. Like. Just you know, just chill out. Tesla's yeah. gonna be fine. Yeah, it's it's not an ideal situation. It's not like it, it doesn't make me proud to be in the part in the Tesla community when 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 I hear stories like that. So just keep that in check, people. Yeah, and I would say it also kind of you know like we're we're not traditional automotive journalists, but I would mm -hmm. say ninety percent of traditional automotive journalists have the opinion that Tesla fans are all bad shit. Oh yeah insane yeah. that beep insane they uh they pretty much like whenever they do a tesla article they know that their comments are just going to be and it's not it's definitely not all tesla fans it's you know mm. the the one percent or you know two yeah. percent a very vocal minority right they give us a bad name for everyone so stop defending them because you you feel like they are on the same team as you just they can still be in the same team. Just correct them when they're being too combative about that stuff. It's just it's, there's no there's no need for it. Yeah, uh, that I guess that's a message here. Um, uh, but it was a big story in the Tesla community this week. Like all, all everyone jumped on it, so I thought I'd give my two cents too. All right, moving on from Tesla, we have a few news items to discuss for more articles, and then we're gonna jump into the comment section. So if you guys have any question for us right now about the stories this week about it, the Gelson AV community. Um, let us know, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get to them in a few minutes. But uh, this was kind of an interesting story this week. Uh, the uh, Volkswagen sort of uh, gave a big commitment to bi-directional charging. They said that starting next year, all vehicles on their EMB platform, which I think is pretty much all their electric vehicles they're making these days, uh, are gonna ha are gonna support bi-directional charging. So they're gonna they're gonna look at. Uh, any type of vehicle to grid or that vehicle to everything they call it now, because uh, you can get vehicle to home, vehicle to vehicle, or vehicle to grid, and uh, they're all going to support that. So that's a, it's kind of a big deal because, of course, Volkswagen is is considered one of the leaders in electrification in terms of volume. As soon as next year, they they're planning to make hundreds of thousands of electric vehicles. So uh, this vehicle to grid thing hasn't become very popular, but hasn't become very popular because the true value of it comes with volume. Uh, like uh, it, the, the the more you have of them, because no no one wants to drain their battery pack from it, of course. But if if you can find a balance between just 
getting some energy out or, or just not getting energy in, like just controlling the charging capacity too, not just um, not just vehicle to something else. Uh, but if you have just a tiny bit of that with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of vehicles on a network, that has tremendous value for, for an electric utility. So minimal impact on the owner, plus uh, with uh, financial compensation for the owner, and massive value for the electric grid to reduce uh, costs. So, and energy use in different like you, you would, if you can control the load like that, you, you would you would need a, a lot of the big uh, peaker plant that are very polluting and, and costly. So a lot like uh, Tesla has been focusing, of course, on the energy storage side to deploy actual energy storage at the uh, utility level. But if you just control the load of those electric vehicles, that would be massive. So. Before that, mostly uh, Nissan was the kind of the only one that actually had it in passenger cars. But again, the volume wasn't quite big enough for it to, to be valuable. But now Volkswagen is getting involved. And of course, uh, Tesla announced last year that uh, all its future vehicles are also going to be equipped with bi bi directional charging. So when you have Nissan on board, Volkswagen and Tesla, we're starting to talk about volumes. And now if the hardware is there, uh, electric utilities are going to be able to look at, okay, how many electric vehicles are using our, our grid and how many of them we can embark in, in this sort of vehicle to grid program and uh, what kind of value we can get out of that and what kind of value we can return to those owners. And uh, I, I think I think it's going to be a big part of the solution long term. Because a lot of people have been talking about, oh, can you imagine electric vehicles cannot be the future? Because can you imagine everyone having an electric vehicle and charging their car? It's going to destroy the electric grid. Actually, no, because most electric cars charge at night when the grid has more capacity than demand. So if it's managed correctly, electric vehicles can actually help the grid rather than hurt it. So, uh, and it's not, and it's not just the grid. Um, it's important to note, like not everybody has very reliable electricity. Yeah. And a lot of people have, you know, gas generators that require maintenance and oil and all the things that, you know, gas engines have. And those cost about, you know, if you have a good one that's going to power your house and it, it's directly connected to your uh, uh, circuit box, those are like 3000 5000 you know, install, everything like that. If you're adding that ability to keep your house going for three or four days from your car, that's, you know, that's a big plus. Like, mm -hmm. uh I think, you know, that that's an energy independence kind of thing that, you know, you can't really even put a price on sometimes. Yeah, that, that's a good point. That's a added value at the consumer level for just buying the car. Like you might be more tempted to buy a car with bidirectional charging rather than not for the backup usage of it. But I think in terms uh, of actual like overall uh, monetary value, I think the grid services is going to be where the, uh, the money is at. All right, this is kind of a half news, really. <laughs> uh, GM made a big deal about it this week, but the, the, they held this whole presentation about building the Chevrolet Silverado electric pickup at the new Factory Zero. Uh, they had a press conference, but the whole press conference to me felt like uh, it was for the employees there. It's like, guys, don't worry about your job. We're going to build electric vehicles here, so your job's going to be safe. Yeah, but, there was a lot of union stuff going on. Yeah, 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 exactly. But um, but ultimately, they just basically confirmed that the, the Chevy pickup that they presently mentioned as only the Chevrolet BET truck, which is going to be a full-size pickup truck with over 400 miles of range on a single charge, is going to be a Silverado electric, basically. Uh, no timeline yet or anything like that. So that's why I say that it wasn't, it wasn't that exciting of a news. Like, we just really want a timeline or, on that. Or because, specs or image or well, this, anything. Other than the 500 miles, we don't have anything. Right. Uh, in terms of image, we did see something like uh, last year with like in the background of that presentation, that investor presentation. We have that truck here, which basically again looks like a electric version of a Silverado. But but yeah, we, we need we need a timeline on that because uh, the Hummer EV is certainly cool. Like it has like it packs a ton of features and it's very um, nice specs and everything. But it's it's massive and it's uh, it's expensive. Uh, so it's not really something that's going to compete very closely, I think, with uh, things like the Cybertruck or the Rivian R1T, or probably even like even the Ford F150, even though that's a little bit further out. So yeah, I think the Silverado Electric is going to be that uh, competitor for them, uh, but uh, they need to uh, hurry up and bring that to the market. Yeah, I mean that's the general theme with GM is like they 
introduced tons of stuff like we you know a year ago saw like 15 evs and they're always like oh we're about the electric feature but like just put them on the lots right now yeah. if you go to a, a gm lot on in the very back in the corner you might find one chevy bolt so it's quite frustrating that we know that gm right now their factories are just churning out tons of ICE vehicles and you know some bolts gas goslers i mean they're yeah. all about their pickups yeah and i mean the biggest thing was the bolt ev bolt uv that got i got pushed back a little bit after the unveiling like that was that was a big bummer but uh those are finally coming soon so yep all right mercedes mercedes has been kind of weird with their eqs unveiling they've been like just trickling down information they unveil just the screen at first then they unveil just the interior now they unveil the um the specs they release the specs and features and a long list of specs, uh, not long, especially the features, like all the luxury features. Like this is this is a S class like competitor basically. So uh, it, it packs a punch when it comes to features. There's a ton of luxury features in that thing. But we, whoop. but we are more uh, interested in the the specs of the vehicle, and and those are, are pretty are looking pretty good too. So the production specs now is going to be two options: ninety kilowatt hour and one hundred and eight kilowatt hour battery packs. Huge. Huge, and I was surprised too because those are also pretty pretty close. Like uh, just an eighteen kilowatt hour difference uh, for a vehicle of that size. Like this, uh, this is an interesting approach for them. So the range they're talking about up to 770, 770 kilometers, which is the equivalent of four hundred seventy eight miles of range. That's on the WLTP. So we don't know exactly what the EPA range is going to be, but I feel like it could surprise us because. I mean, it, it, it's big, big, uh, big battery pack. Uh, the range figure they, they're saying up to, so I assume they were talking about the 108 kilowatt hour battery pack. Uh, but that's combined with an impressive 0 0.0 coefficient drag value. Uh, so point, this point is two, point 0.20, you said? Yeah, 0 0.20. So that's a slippery car right there. Like it's extremely aerodynamic. So slippery car, even slipperier than Tesla's. Huge battery pack, even bigger than Tesla's. Mm -hmm. So put those two together, and you got a lot of range. Yeah, I mean, at the same time, we don't know how they're going to present that EPA range because, uh, I mean, Mercedes right. has an history of being a little bit more conservative with that. So, so they might not actually beat be Tesla on the advertised range, uh, but when it comes to actually driving that car, you you could be surprised by it. Or at the same time, they could change their strategy and just let's, all right, we're going to play Tesla's game and just keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And then they could come up with like a 450 miles of range uh, EPA. I, I don't know. I think they could. I, I really think they could. But again, uh, it depends on how they approach it. Uh, the power output you can change, you can choose between a bunch of different uh, motor configuration from 245 to 385 kilowatts of power. So decent enough. It's not, performance yeah it's not crazy like the model s plat for example but uh, it's going to compete with like the lower uh performance model s uh, charging capacity of 200 kilowatts which is uh, more than decent solid yeah uh if you want to go into all the features i mean I, I suggest you go watch the you go read the post that we made on electric i mean there's literally hundreds of little features with that car a lot of things that we would expect in a luxury vehicle but uh, the, the it, it, it's solid. Like it, they 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 didn't uh, cut any corners with it. Like uh, uh, you have plug and play in it. You you have like all the um, thing that you would expect in a electric vehicle coming out in twenty twenty one. Plus everything you would expect from a luxury vehicle coming out in twenty twenty one. Base price? Oh, we don't have that <laughs> just yet. But I would assume that they're gonna try to do something like. Um, S class plus uh, incentive. So after incentive, comparable to the S class price. I think that's because th that's a problem. When I mean, at least they didn't go with the same. Like they didn't go with S class electric or something right. like that. So they used the EQS subbrand or the EQ subbrand, I should say. But I mean, they did use the S in there, and we all know like this is an S class size vehicle. So it, it, when you do that, you always have a problem with the pricing because you, normally the pricing on your car is much higher, the sticker price, even though when you account to, for the uh, cost of, total cost of ownership after gas saving and everything, you're probably going to save money with it. Uh, what's the Mercedes? 
Uh, Ben's S class US cost. I would guess 50, no, 60 something. Wow, you're way 80, wrong. 80, 90. Way wrong. 180. <laughs> 110. Really? Yeah. For an S class? A new I one, mean, I guess. Yeah. I thought it was a bit cheaper than that. Shows what, how much I'm I know. Looking at a different, like a special version of it. No, 2021 Mercedes S Class US pricing starts 110. If you want the executive line, now you go 130. Jeez, it's not cheap. So all these people driving around 130 thousand dollar cars that I see. That's yeah, nice. because you, you see a lot of S Class out there. Like uh, maybe not as much as the E Class, but still, you see you see quite a lot. I mean, they are extremely luxurious. Like the, the inside, like they have all those massage seats and whatnot. <laughs> it goes up fast. It, yeah, yeah. I'm surprised. Oh I, wait, I, I found it for ninety four thousand near me, but that's a twenty twenty. Uh, okay, so okay, twenty twenty one. I mean, the MS with the twenty twenty one coming out, they have to reduce the price of the twenty twenty. Right. Yeah, but, but it's it, it's expensive. it's not cheap. Yeah. So all right, that now I'm kind of bummed because uh, I'm. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Uh, I think the S, the AQS is going to be expensive then. Uh boy. All right. Let's wait and see. Could be we could be surprised. I don't know. I don't know. All yeah. right, one more news item and then we're going to get to questions so you guys put your question in the comment section. We're going to get there in a minute. The um yeah, we kind of touched it with Jim uh, earlier, but the there's a rumor right now going about the electric um the incentive in the US going up to $10,000. So there was something. There was a thing that uh, the Biden administration announced uh, earlier. Uh, that was last month. At this point, announced last month that the 174 billion dollars that they plan to invest in electrification, 100 billion of that is going to go toward this uh, the actual rebate. Which the the only thing, but it didn't go into details what that incentive is going to look like, other than. It's going to not just be a tax incentive uh, anymore. It's also going to be a point of sale rebate, which is on its own. It's a big deal. And it's going to be for only American made EVs, which is also a big deal. But in terms of how they're going to change the whole uh, threshold of 200,000 units, how they're going to change the timeline if they, if they, uh, if they remove the threshold in terms of units and they replace it with a, a time period or anything like that, we don't know. Uh, we know that there's been a bunch of uh, new bills have been introduced to reform it, but we don't know which they're going to try to push in the infrastructure bill. Uh, so we ha we have the um, Green Act, which was uh, reducing actually the amount to seven thousand and seven seventy five hundred, but was pushing it to an additional four hundred thousand vehicles instead of the two hundred thousand dollar limits on top of the two hundred thousand dollar limits, two hundred thousand units limits, I should say. Uh, then you had the Electric Cars Act, which was uh, more generous a little bit and uh, was actually putting a uh, um, ten-year period on the current uh, $7,500 tax rate. So the removing the amounts and going with the time period. But now um, Dan Hives at Wedbush, or one of the top analysts that's covering Tesla and the electric vehicle market, said that he's hearing from the grapevines in Washington that they are looking to put a $10,000 incentive on it. Uh, so that, that would be a massive deal. So whether they go with the 400,000 units or a 5, 10-year period or whatever, um, if they increase it to $10,000 and they make it a point of sell, that's massive because now you're going to see dealership, you're going to see people advertising with that $10,000 price uh, reduction. Because because of the tax rate, you can't really advertise with that because right. it depends on your, your tax burden at the federal level. Uh, so, so in, in, and it, you, you're gonna have to pay the seventy five hundred dollars. You're just gonna get it as a tax credit uh, in your, on your next taxes. Now sure. they're gonna remove the ten thousand dollars at a price tag. So your thirty eight thousand dollars model three gonna cost you twenty eight thousand dollars out of pocket. Massive, if if it happens, it's it, it's gonna it, it's gonna change everything for the next few years. And a hundred billion dollars. I didn't make them. I didn't do the math in the article. I should have done that. Didn't even think of it. But when you talk about billions, it's always like you know when you have to switch your iPhone on this side because yes. the numbers are too are too big. Like that's uh, <laughs> uh, divided by ten thousand. 
It's too many zeros. I have to do the math. That's 10 million vehicles. Yeah, that's that's a good year. And that, yeah, that's a good amount. I mean, with the capacity that we have right now, and that's U.S. made too. Right. Um, I mean, that's that's 10 years. Uh, 10 well, years we, of production at least for now. Of course, the production should, capacity is going to increase. But we should talk about some of the nuances, though. That's only American made. So, like for yeah. instance, the Ford Mustang Mach E, which is made in Mexico. That one is not going to be there. Then, you know, we, we talked about earlier the, uh, you know, where is the price cap going to be? Is it going to be 40,000, 50,000, 45,000? Um, we, we saw a video of uh, the transportation, uh, the Department of Transportation had uh, Pete Buttigieg talk about how um, they wanted to make the uh, EV incentive for... He didn't actually mention the EV incentive. It just said we have to make electric vehicles not a luxury item. Right, right. So that's more vague because like, that, that's more uh, we just need to make electric car cheaper so an incentive on them makes sense. It's but vague, I do. But yeah. That, that, that I definitely got the feeling that they were definitely aiming at the lower end of the market, which I think is good. Yeah. Like you, if you want to get more people buying electric cars, that's where it's at. Um, and, you know, frankly, at the high end, I think you know, the, the, the cost of the battery and all that other stuff yeah. kind of fades, you know, becomes less of a factor. So, I mean, we're, we're talking about like right now, the Chevy, you know, 2020 Chevy Bolt is uh, $30,000. You can buy one new. Uh, so that's a $20,000 car. And in California, that's like, a, you know, in the teens. So mm -hmm. that's going to be pretty hot, I think, if that, if that happens. And then, you know, there's a bunch of other, uh, you know, lower price like the Kia, Although the key is not made in the U.S., so I don't know if that's gonna. Yeah, I mean that, that that's that, that's what's exciting too. I mean Hyundai now with that Ionic Five looking so sexy and that uh, EV6 from 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 Kia, like they have to 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 make a big investment in the U.S. and just start start producing cars there. It's like it makes absolutely makes sense. Yeah, and then you know that you know Volkswagen is making the ID4. Maybe they'll start mm -hmm. selling the ID3. Um, in the U.S., well, yeah. they'll, they'll have to start making it in the U.S. and then sell them in the U.S. But we know the ID. Four um, at base price could could get under that fifty thousand dollar threshold, um, and those are going to be made in Chattanooga. Even the batteries are going to be uh, U.S. made. So um, it, it'll be a good it'll be a good scene if if that that legislation passes. Yeah. Now here's the exciting thing to get out that twenty five thousand dollar Tesla that Tesla plans to make in China. <laughs> To design and, and manufacture in China, like now Tesla kind of okay, keep the design and engineering in China, that's fine, but also manufacture it also in the US. Because even if it ends up costing like thirty thousand dollars, uh that ten thousand dollar incentive will make it twenty thousand and Tesla would just sell those by the millions. Yeah. I mean, really like I know I know nobody likes the the Chevy Bolt design except me, but like if if Tesla made a good look like get Franz on it, make it look really nice. That exact car, uh, hatchback, super fast, uh, you know, the, the autopilot, that would be a pretty, pretty hot car. Yeah, I definitely. Think. I mean, the, the, we know that the $25,000 Tesla is probably, it's going to be without that FSD and whatnot. But, right. Uh, yeah. It's still It'll be an add-on. I'm sure they'll have the yeah. cameras or whatever. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I agree. All right. Uh, should we get into the comments now? Let's get in there. Um, so we had a, some questions cool. from uh, about uh, Elms, but uh, Jim is no longer with us, so I don't really want to get, get in there that. too much. But um, so Igor Grubb says, "What are the pros and cons between 400 and 800 volt systems? Which one will become standard?" I mean, 400 volts still works great. Through. I, I, I just, I don't, I don't know how big of a cost difference it is to go to 800 volts um, because we're starting to see them more and more in cheaper vehicle, or what at least what we're expecting is going to be somewhat cheaper vehicles like the Ionic uh, Five. Um, I mean, it's not that cheap of a vehicle either, but but still. Uh, it's not just the the Taycan anymore. That's eight hundred volts. That's what I'm saying. Right, right. And I guess the Audi GT. And is there any other like eight hundred volt systems? I mean, we know like Remac and and stuff like that, but mass produced. Also, on the Hyundai, we don't know. I mean, we know it charges at eight hundred volts, but we don't know if like the motor and and the the systems work at eight hundred volts. So 
that 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 kind of remains to be seen. Um, you know, obviously the advantages are, you know, 800 volt system, you don't need as thick of wires going around because you need half the amps to do the same thing. So you're going to save some money in wiring, but then the, the components cost more, but theoretically, um, those come down as you make more of them. But um, charging is obviously the biggest difference. Yeah. Charging yeah. fast is, is kind of where it's at. Um, so I don't know. It, it's a... It's a good both, question. Both can coexist, basically, too. It's not like one of the other. Right. Way. Yeah. What's nice about 400 volt is there's a lot of other stuff like solar systems that are 400 volts, too. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a DC standard. All right. Uh, Nanda Holtz, uh, the 93 mile is sexy leaf. Okay. I think that was directed yeah. at your comment about the. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's accurate. That's basically what you're buying. You're buying a good looking leaf, basically. Yeah. All right, Sean Goggin says, thank you, Fred, for the Tesla Bears article. I see the unjust Gordon Johnson comments all over. Yeah, yeah that was that was an annoying situation there. I mean, a lot of people also said, oh, you're just writing that because you said the Tesla toxic article before that, so now you're attacking another. I'm not. I, I posted that article because I just don't understand why financial media are giving this guy a platform to say like just ridiculous things about Tesla all the time. Uh, he, he's one of the, the worst Tesla bears I've seen. Like it's just, it's, it's crazy. And in this case, the street promoted his idea that just a rumor that started on social media in China that Tesla gave a discount on a thousand vehicles going to see CATL. And he used that as a way to dismiss Tesla's record quarters of deliveries. So I'm just saying this. This uh, it wasn't especially. It, it wasn't like a balancing thing. Like I, I don't care that much about the, about the balance of that stuff. I cared about like let's not listen to that guy, especially for 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 that misinformation he was trying to spell, to spread. All right, uh, from Facebook, Shanada Hill Russell says the under Las Vegas highway is hella cool. And, oh uh, well, Shanda, you're easily impressed. <laughs> It doesn't exist, but it will uh, be. I mean, it sort of exists if you reference the Las Vegas Convention Center loop that uh, was kind of unveiled this week. With uh, I don't know if it was the boring company really, or uh, I think it was more the Convention Center that might have invited people to uh, local journalists to to, to to check it out. But uh, the consensus it wasn't that it was hella cool. It was more like it was kind of uh, fitting for the name of the boring company, which was kind of boring because. They were like driving at 35 miles an hour in that thing instead of the, the 150 that Elon was talking about, and uh, and also it wasn't self-driven too. It wasn't they wasn't they weren't using the autopilot. They actually had to use um, drivers, which is I mean it's like a tiny little taxi service with one lane on the ground right now. It's not it's not great. Right. I'm not saying that it cannot be great, but I mean, I, that's certainly not the vision that Elon has been selling everyone about. Right. And company. then, of course, the Tesla detractors are like, hey, Elon, mm. why not just use a train? Which, yeah. of course. Of course, right. it's, it's, it's just a small piece of like the bigger loop under Las Vegas that they want right. to do. Once it's that, it starts making more sense. But I think they have to take the drivers out because, first of all, is there a more boring job in the world? Like, I mean, taxi driving, like or Uber and everything like that. Like, I mean, you see things and everything. Like, right, you're just you seeing walls going by. Yeah, you drive around. Now you're just one lane in a tunnel way back. Like, oh, that would be wow. I yeah. hope they're well paid. All right, Shane O'Sullivan says the question with LFP is: Will Panasonic produce it in the USA, or will Tesla partner with Cattle and have an in-house partnership? I mean, those are two options, but I don't know if either of those are going to happen. What do you think? Uh, well, I, like Tesla is obviously moving to that 4680 from Factor 2, which is a big deal. But they want to use a, a, a chemistry, I mean, at, at least closer to LFP in, in that battery format at, at some point. So, um, And both of those battery partners mentioned that they want to produce that battery for Tesla. So... Yeah, it's possible, but like you said, uh, making it in the U.S. is uh, is is the big difference. Uh, I think both both of those companies going to announce some capacity or more, or more capacity in the U.S. in the near future. So let's keep an eye on that. Yeah, uh, Joe Smith, could the Model S refresh be delayed because it is using front and rear castings? Maybe that's a that that could be a part of it. 
it would certainly make sense for Tesla to start moving to that, especially with the long delay. Uh, but uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand enough the capacity of the of those giga presses at at, at Fremont to understand if they can both support Model, Model Y, Model Three, and SNX at the same time. Nick Thomas says, and this is our last question. Pretty psyched for the Hummer EV's six kilowatt bi-directional charging capabilities. Is it six kilowatt? Hmm. I, didn't I didn't know if that was the Hummer EV was six kilowatt. What is the um, yeah Ionic Five? Isn't that similar, or three kilowatts or something? Yeah, I want to say three. Yeah, six. I mean, uh, you can run a whole house. Uh, right, and they're going to have huge batteries too. So yeah. that'll be pretty cool for uh, keeping your house going. All right. Yeah, and it. I feel like people that have a Hummer EV too, it's not their only car too. It's probably one that's sitting like you just you want to take it outside to go. Because uh, I mean, <laughs> even electric. It's not going to be that efficient of a car. Like, no, no. Like you don't all. want to be driving your gas gosling Hummer uh, as a commuter car because it's just going to cost you a fortune in gas. Uh, it's not going to be the same with an electric one, but still, I mean, if your electricity is like 20, 20 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, it's going to cost you because that thing is not efficient. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening and watching the, the show. I know we had a different hours today because we wanted to fit in. Uh, the uh, electric last mile interview with uh, Mr. Uh, James, but uh, it's uh, it, it was a ton of fun. We're gonna try to maybe have the uh, tweak with that format a little bit and have something different in the future. So uh, let us know your feedback on that. That that would be appreciated. Um, if you like the show and only if you liked it, give us a thumbs up. That's uh, help for the uh, YouTube algorithm for some reason. That uh, goes beyond my head. Uh, if you want to know um, when the next episode is, is coming out, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification for uh, uh, to know when we're going live, um, which is going to help if we change the timing like that a little bit sometimes. And on your podcast app, if you can give us a, a five-star review, that, that's also a big deal for us. It really helps the podcast grow, and we appreciate it a lot when you guys do that and leave us a... We read them all, too, so if you leave some nice word, we appreciate it. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're going to see you uh, next week. Have a good weekend, guys.